and he'd work. We can start or we can wait a few minutes more. What do you think? Um, I asked them. Can you or what do you No. No. Can you Can you Okay, then the gate. One minute more, so just to have five minutes delay. Nu vreți venit să leacă mai față, așa că vă altfel. Okay. Îmi pare că sunt în Kamchatka. Uh, we are live. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, let's use the micro. Uh, dear colleagues and friends, good afternoon, and it's a great pleasure to uh, start the, the meeting uh, which we plan today with our uh, great friend from Vienna, Sebastian Schaeffer, but we know each other already for a decade because he visited Moldova many times and we did together a lot of projects um, under umbrella of our university. Many seminars, workshops, summer school, and some autumn schools too. So yes. anyway, together of um, Moldovan colleagues uh, and also of colleagues and uh, friends from Ukraine, uh, Germany, and um, some other countries probably, yeah. So um, uh, nowadays we are talking about one anniversary because Sebastian is representing the institute Danube, and he will say more about the institute itself, which was created or founded in 1953, uh, immediately after Second World War, um, and he will tell you more information about the mission, about the goal and objective of the institute, but the institute is a really strong partner of many institutions, universities especially, uh, around Europe and especially countries, and including universities um, along with the Danube River. Um, institutions which are interested to uh, develop partnerships in various act, uh, area of activities, uh, including um, academic, including the uh, political uh, science development, and also different other um, analysis groups which are trying to uh, monitor or try to do different research concerning the situation in uh, the region, but also to uh, propose different um, solutions for various situations in the area, including conflicts and post-conflict situations. So, Sebastian, you are welcome back to Chisinau and really glad that you um, find the time to come to Chisinau uh, again. And I hope we will recover uh, our uh, systematic activities and the visits and projects together after the pandemic, which actually did a crack between uh, uh, different initiatives and uh, activities which we did before. So you are welcome and the floor is yours. Um, now we have a students, especially from the foreign department. Some of them are from the history department and um, some colleagues, some teachers, professors also from these uh, two departments. And uh, I hope most of them are from the English language specialty. So I hope that the presentation will be useful for them to learn more about uh, activity of the Institute, about the projects, and also about your view uh, on situation in our region and, of course, perspective of the European Union integration of Republic of Moldova. So, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sergio. It's a, it's a, it's a great pleasure and an honor um, to return. A lot of things have changed here, not only in the country. Some improvements, yeah. Um, I, we remember the seminar room that we used for our activities. Um, but uh, it's the same at, at IDM, actually. The pandemic changed a lot, and uh, we are much more digitalized. We have these possibilities, but uh, nothing beats meeting in person, and I'm very happy that I could return to Chisinau. And uh, thank you for organizing this, Sergio. Sergio is not only a great cooperation partner and a great friend, but Sergio is also a member of the IDM International Council. And uh, with this, I'm uh, very happy that we have this cooperation also in our 70 years initiatives. What we do with uh, the IDM, and I'm going to briefly talk about what the mission of the Institute is and what we are doing before I then move over to a proposal that we uh, have developed at the IDM, how to support Moldova's integration into the European Union. Um, what we are doing at IDM, we have um, in, in total, um, we have in total 19 countries that we are working with in the Danube region. And uh, as uh, uh, Sergio already mentioned, the foundation was in 1953. It was founded back then in Salzburg because uh, Vienna was still a divided city. The um, Allied forces um, had uh, uh, still 
um, occupied uh, Austria. Austria was not sovereign, but already then the vision was that something will disappear behind that Iron Curtain and the IDM was trying to um, uh, foster the connections so that they are not severed, that they are not uh, lost. And of course, over the, the following decades, a lot of things changed, a lot of situation um, development uh, in our region, as you all know, happened. And uh, with uh, 40 years later, the Institute was renamed to the name that it has now, the Institute for the Danube region and Central Europe. Because uh, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, with the Iron Curtain coming down, new opportunities arose, new possibilities in Central Europe uh, arose, new countries uh, developed, and uh, with uh, this also the mission of the Institute uh, changed. Uh, in 1995, Erhard Busek, the former Vice-Chancellor of Austria, uh, became the chairman, and uh, with his vision on Central Europe, um, the um, activities of IDM have been developing over the next uh, decades. Um, since uh, 2003, the 50th uh, anniversary, we are located now at the uh, Hahngasse in uh, Vienna. And um, in 2019, when uh, I had the honor to become the director of the IDM, we also developed our new slogan that is trying to embody um, the activities that we are doing with European perspectives, but regional um, actions. We are trying to not only um, keep democracy in Central Europe, but also try to fulfill the promise that was given to the Western Balkan countries uh, 20 years ago at the summit in uh, Thessaloniki that they will potentially become a EU <coughs> member state. And then um, also we are taking um, care of the not only Austrian but in general European neighborhood and here especially I would say the Danube Delta which uh, for us includes of course Moldova and uh, Ukraine. Now we all know that the situation in 2022 drastically changed with the candidate status we are no longer um, focusing on uh, fostering European neighborhood policy but we are also fostering the EU integration of Ukraine and Moldova. So for us now, um, again, the mission changed. Also, a very um, deep cut in the development of the Institute happened last year when uh, our long-term chairman, Erhard Busek, um, died, unfortunately. And uh, we um, were uh, able to um, get a new chairman with uh, Rector Friedrich Faulhammer who uh, has been a long-standing uh, partner of the Institute, has been uh, the vice chair of the Institute, and uh, is currently again also um, the president of the Danube Rectors Conference, where we, as uh, Sergio mentioned, have these corporations with um, uh, 64 universities in uh, the Danube region. And uh, through all this development, through all of this, uh, we decided that in our anniversary year 2023, we try to have a regional initiative in all of our 19 uh, countries. And uh, this is our regional initiative in Moldova. This is uh, what uh, we are uh, implementing uh, here. We have uh, this week uh, also been, uh, amongst others, in Portgorica and uh, in uh, Leipzig. Um, we are, I, ha I have been to, to Kiev, uh, we have been to uh, Slovenia already, we have been to, to various places. Uh, we'll continue this until the big uh, celebration um, of the 70 years on 5th of December um, is going uh, to happen, where we will, of course, include everything that we've learned on that journey, because it's not something where we say we come <coughs> and tell you what the Institute is doing. We are here to have that exchange, and as I mentioned, the personal exchange is something that was really missing over the past um, years. So, uh, when we uh, briefly talk about the mission nowadays of uh, the Institute, we believe that regions are the future of Europe. We believe that regional integration will help to ultimately um, fulfill the promises that were given with regards to European integration. And uh, our idea is always to um, not only uh, talk about countries, but talk about uh, talk with the people in the countries. And therefore, for us, it's very, very important um, to, to keep this connection. We try to do this um, through various online formats, um, but we are very happy that we can return 
to this um, personal exchange that I've mentioned now uh, already a couple of times. Very briefly maybe to our um, institute and the team, we have um, in total with us uh, 10 um, members of the academic team and two members of the administrative team. We are uh, specializing on uh, various uh, topics, but also various uh, countries. So my colleagues are on the one hand side uh, specialized on uh, some of the countries uh, that the IDM is working with, but they also have their own uh, topical specialization. And additionally to that, I'm very uh, glad that um, for instance, my colleague Daniel is now taking care of the live stream at home. So um, also within the, the uh, various formats that we have, uh, these um, people are uh, helping out and we are working very closely uh, together in a, in a rather small uh, team, but with uh, very big uh, activities. We do have research projects, um, EU-funded research projects at the moment running regarding the European parliamentary elections that are going to happen. Uh, next year's, uh, as, as Sergio mentioned, we are organizing summer schools, not only uh, us together, but also within other uh, frameworks. We in total have around 50 to 60 events per year, which means roughly one uh, per week. Um, as I said, this week, uh, this is our fourth event. Uh, actually, earlier this morning, there was a, an event on the parliamentary election happened in uh, Poland on, on, on Sunday. Um, we also have uh, the Danubius Awards, so we are also trying to foster research in our region. And within these Danubius Awards, uh, there are three different categories. And one category, which is probably then interesting also for you, is the Danubius Young Scientist Award. Um, you can uh, let yourself be nominated uh, through your university every year. Uh, because it's uh, awarded to one of the 14 countries of the European Union strategy for the Danube region, which also includes uh, Moldova. So watch out um, every, um, every spring, a call for um, being nominated is uh, presented, and maybe uh, one of the future awardees is sitting in this room. Um, we also produce a podcast. We almost have 50 episodes of uh, a podcast series, which is called Central Europe Explained. And we do organize these YouTube live streams, not only in our regional 70 years initiatives, but also with these parliamentary elections that I mentioned, or um, ambassador talks where they, uh, when they newly accredited come to Vienna, can present themselves um, up to also a regional format that we have where we talk with experts in the region of current, uh, about current developments. Recently, for instance, um, the uh, election results in Slovakia. Additionally to the uh, project activities that we have. We also have our publications, uh, and Sergio has uh, uh, already also uh, majorly contributed uh, to yeah. one of our publication series, the Donauraum. It's a scientific journal of our institute that is continuously published since 1956. We also have a uh, scientific communication uh, journal that is published three times a year uh, together with uh, the Austrian daily newspaper, Die Presse. We have um, a now electronic uh, newsletter. There is a blog. We have um, also, from time to time, irregularly studies. Uh, the late last study that we've published, um, now also again, I think two years ago, was actually about public procurement um, in Moldova. And uh, we have the IDM policy paper series where we develop um, special um, uh, recommendations for decision makers with regards to burning uh, topics in our target region. And with this, I want to move over to the more topical uh, part of my uh, brief presentation, because uh, one of the policy papers that we uh, have published um, uh, last year, on uh, actually the 24th of uh, June, when Moldova received, uh, together with Ukraine, the candidate status, is uh, a policy paper that is called the day after towards a greater European Council that uh, I have uh, co-authored with another common uh, colleague of ours, Ulrich Neckener, uh, where we have uh, implemented various uh, of these mentioned uh, summer schools. And um, he did the university too, so. Yes, yes. So um, he is, uh, he is uh, also, uh, in, in the past month, uh, he had been a visiting fellow at IDM, and we have um, given um, a, a talk on our 
um, uh, common policy paper and I want to um, elaborate a little bit more about what we have um, written down here and how that actually um, we believe could foster European integration <laughs> not only of Moldova but of all potential um, candidate countries. As we know with regards to um, the full-scale invasion of the Russian Federation in Ukraine, the OSCE um, became completely paralyzed. It was already sort of dysfunctional uh, before that. Um, it, uh, it was uh, more of a uh, talking shop um, that uh, various statements have been uh, read out. Some of the election monitoring and also some of the work, of course, in, in Moldova um, was able to continue, but with the full-scale invasion, um, the OSCE, um, to our assessment, became completely uh, paralyzed and especially in its role as a pan-European forum for cooperative uh, security is uh, further marginalized. Um, we have the uh, role of the uh, United States, which is, uh, of course, uh, still remaining as one of the major guarantees for uh, European security, which is a challenge for the European Union itself. Additionally, um, I think we have all uh, followed in horror what uh, developed over the weekend in uh, Israel with these heinous terrorist attacks from Hamas. Um, we will uh, see here further strains on the uh, security, um, not only uh, within uh, the United States as a guarantor, but also for the European Union um, as direct uh, consequences. What we have also seen, though, um, is a revival of NATO. We have seen uh, a new NATO uh, member with Finland, a second one, which is currently uh, still being blocked by uh, Hungary and Turkey. Um, it's a different story. I, I, I really don't understand uh, the reasons. I see the arguments, but I don't understand them. In any case, we see here also that uh, the challenge was never really about NATO um, um, enlargement, um, obviously, with regards uh, to Ukraine from the side of the Kremlin. But also the role of the EU, of course, uh, changed um, in the sense that what we could see is if you would have asked someone on the 23rd of February 2022 if Moldova and Ukraine should become a EU member country, they wouldn't have dared to say yes. A day later, um, it completely changed. And uh, on the one hand side, I am very happy because uh, with the start of the Eden Partnership in 2009, I already argued that um, all the target countries of the Eastern Partnership um, including Moldova, should receive a potential candidate status. Um, but no EU official was uh, uh, daring to, to um, also reiterate this. And uh, it's a bit um, challenging, I would say, that if you have an um, a, 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 a event as uh, tragic as the full-scale invasion, that this only uh, changes uh, the situation um, then. Yes, we, we wait briefly. Come in. I'll, I'll wait a bit uh, so you can comfortably join. It's great that uh, even more people are joining. Thank you. Welcome. So apart from, from this, also, um, not only the um, enlargement strategy of the European Union needs to be changed, but also with regards to the remaining target countries of the Eastern Partnership, we maybe need to see and rethink how the Eastern Partnership can actually work, or is it actually really still uh, relevant. And um, ultimately, also, I mean, I work in a, in a uh, think tank in uh, Austria, but I'm originally German, so uh, of course I'm also uh, closely following uh, the situation here, and we could see that the role of Germany also uh, drastically uh, changed. Um, we uh, have a, um, a new word that has entered the English-speaking discourse with the Zeitenwende, um, so um, a, a watershed moment, a turning of, of the times, where uh, a complete overthrow of a strategy of a, what we uh, nowadays have to clearly state, the failed German strategy towards uh, the Russian uh, Federation and its intentions in uh, what they call the shared uh, neighborhood is something uh, that we uh, clearly will have to um, uh, talk about um, uh, in, in the midterm uh, future. So this candidate status 
um, uh, the, the rationale behind it, I already mentioned, it's uh, something that uh, was uh, uh, unthinkable um, from the perspective of European Union officials uh, before the full-scale invasion. Um, that changed, um, and this not only changed uh, due to uh, the, the uh, full-scale invasion, but I also believe that it um, ultimately changed because uh, there was a hard work done uh, not only by the government and the officials, but also the civil society, both in Ukraine and in Moldova, that answered the um, questionnaires that are sent out by the European Commission to the countries. And uh, it has been um, done in record time, um, quite impressive work, um, quite determined work. And here, of course, this also puts pressure on the European level. And this is something that um, I would say needs to be kept up. It's very important that this pressure is not uh, going to go away because um, I believe uh, that um, the, the lesson we should learn from uh, 20 years of uh, failed integration of the Western Balkan countries is that if one uh, partner um, is uh, accommodating um, the, the um, uh, non-development, so to say, that uh, the European Union will also not um, um, uh, take uh, measures, apparently, in a direction to further encourage this. I hope I'm, I'm uh, uh, proven wrong in the future here, and I hope that uh, something will change ultimately uh, in the future. However, um, here I clearly state uh, this pressure needs to come from uh, the government and also the civil society of the countries who want to uh, become a member. Um, we here also observe a very uh, technical process. If we look at European integration in the past, it has become even more cumbersome, even longer. Yeah, when we think about, for instance, Austria is only a EU member since 1995. Uh, they applied for membership in 1989, and uh, it took uh, then a couple of years of negotiations, um, and uh, in, on, on average in the past, it was between five and six years. When we look at the situation of the latest enlargements and uh, the last enlargement that actually happened a decade ago with Croatia, they um, have had negotiations that uh, took nine years. And uh, when we look at uh, the situation, for instance, with uh, Montenegro and also Serbia, here we already have negotiations for longer than 10 years. So when they conclude and when they finally become a member where we still don't know when that will happen, we will have um, maybe 12, 13, 14, 15 years, um, which is, of course, not a good sign if the process uh, becomes uh, longer and longer and more technical. In, in general, how um, are these negotiations done? We first receive that candidate status, then we have the accession uh, negotiations with the 33 uh, chapters, Opening and closing um, here always also uh, remains um, the consent of the EU member states. And uh, here I clearly criticize that although enlargement should be a supranational process, so the European Commission is in charge of that uh, procedure, the European Commission should uh, decide uh, about these steps and then the EU member states can still decide if they accept a member country or not in the overall um, 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 ratification of the accession uh, treaty, um, we experience that even the opening of negotiations is sometimes blocked by single member countries and um, this is something that uh, has also contributed, I would believe, to that um, uh, prolongation of the process and the very few process uh, uh, progress that has been made in the Western Balkan countries. So here we uh, can only hope that also a lesson um, is learned um, here. We uh, then see that in these uh, past mistakes, um, additionally to the points that I mentioned with the Western Balkans and the Thessaloniki summit in 2003, um, there was also uh, a, a different road announced with regards to Turkey um, in back already in 2005 where there was an advocation for um, maybe a privileged partnership instead of a full membership. So something else was offered um, already before negotiations have even properly progressed. And um, uh, 
of course, it's a special case, and at the moment, um, as the as the country is um, uh, governed, it's not a fit to become an EU member. But um, we should not forget and repeat a mistake and offer something else to potential candidate countries um, before they even have uh, properly uh, progressed. Of course, we have um, additionally the challenge of the Copenhagen uh, criteria that the whole acquis communautaire, so each uh, regulation and each directive needs to be implemented. And additionally to that, there is also a challenge uh, that there might be concerns regarding the mutual defense clause, which is uh, uh, part of uh, the treaty on the European Union, where um, mutual assistance, if, if, a, if a country is, is attacked, um, is uh, assured. Some say it's uh, even going beyond Article 5 of NATO, others say it's far less. Um, in any case, uh, this, this would be challenges uh, that need to be resolved. We have seen that in the case of Cyprus, uh, a country had become a member that has a uh, more or less frozen conflict inside the country. Um, but if that uh, is a good example to be repeated, um, would be another question. I think that European integration can, uh, for instance, alleviate such a situation. We've seen that in Northern Ireland. We've seen that in South Tyrol. I think European integration can actually benefit to alleviate um, these um, internal conflicts but maybe they need to be resolved before um, an access can actually happen. Of course, when we now see a faster progress, and I see potential not only for Ukraine, but especially also for Moldova, due to the fact that there is no need to translate all the existing directives and legislation um, as it's already existing in Romania, and since Romania is an EU member country, um, that there is a certain advantage um, and a certain momentum with regards to European integration, but that might then further escalate, and we have seen how quickly um, um, conflicts can escalate, um, also, for instance, between Serbia and Kosovo, uh, when they are uh, feeling that they are uh, left out, left behind, or uh, might seize another opportunity to um, actually um, uh, change again borders that have been actually uh, established. And then I've already mentioned this technicality and complexity of EU enlargement that uh, individual members can block uh, that. And uh, additionally to that, over the past uh, decade or so, it has always been said that we need to reform the EU internally before they can enlarge, which is uh, uh, something that uh, I have now more or less the feeling it's become an excuse not to actually enlarge. Because uh, when we look back, these deepening, so having more um, um, uh, policy areas uh, on the supranational level and uh, the widening with the enlargement always went hand in hand. And also when now uh, we see arguments that uh, we should uh, focus more on the absorption capability of the European Union with regards to, yes, of course it's a problem if Ukraine as a um, a largely populated country joins, the common agricultural policy will uh, see a drastic shift um, within the European Union. But the overall majority of EU enlargements have never been for predominantly economic reasons, but have been most of the time stabilizing um, democracies in, uh, on the continent. 81 Greece, 86 Spain and Portugal, and then 2004, <coughs> the Big Bang uh, enlargement, all uh, Central European uh, countries, etc. And I would say, um, if we look back now, this is a real uh, success story, and this is the actual success story of the European Union, and we should uh, really demand that we um, uh, uh, remember that and, and, and keep that in mind, that enlargement um, is uh, a success story with fostering democratic development in the EU uh, member countries. Um, it's not a one-way street and it's not an end. Yeah? These processes can be reversed, which we, sh which we also sadly um, can see in certain uh, situations. But nevertheless, um, let's not uh, forget this. And in order to, to get out of this uh, catch-22, um, different approaches are floating around and one possible solution that was floated um, in uh, 2022 
was uh, this European political community that the French president Emmanuel Macron uh, proposed on uh, Europe Day. And uh, you very well know this because uh, Moldova is one of the uh, only four host countries of a summit of the European political community. I can only imagine uh, how this must have been for the country to have uh, 40 something plus um, heads of state uh, or government uh, coming into uh, the country. But uh, I think that uh, this, uh, this will be um, um, uh, an interesting uh, experience and this uh, this um, this, uh, this 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 picture uh, of of all these uh, heads of state and government is is certainly uh, quite impressive, um, but the overall synergy of this European political community with its very informal um, meeting character, which is uh, as I learned. Um, from the decision makers is very much appreciated at the moment, um, has no longevity. Um, this picture can be repeated maybe once, maybe twice. Um, in the first meeting in, 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 in Prague, we also saw the picture of uh, negotiations between Pashinyan and uh, Aliyev, but uh, this has not alleviated the situation. Um, and they are not, uh, they have not been negotiating uh, in uh, Grenada in, in, in the third uh, summit. It was three, uh, only have four listed because the next one is, is only in the future in, in, in the UK uh, next year. In any case, so what we believe is that we need a different format. We need a more uh, inclusive uh, format and our uh, solution here would be the so-called uh, Greater European Council. We believe that when we have a, a transformation to a more institutionalized setting and more institutionalized uh, format without making it too cumbersome, there is a possibility that we um, bridge the gap that has been uh, um, uh, existing now, not only with regards to European security, but we would also bridge the gap to former EU member countries, countries that want to become a member and countries that probably never will join the European Union because uh, they simply don't want to or they simply can't uh, because they do not fulfill the Copenhagen criteria. But we would have a forum where we um, make decisions, uh, find general conclusions, common positions and actions which are, I think, uh, direly needed because uh, a lot of the challenges that we have nowadays are simply not stopping at borders or don't care if you are a EU member country or not because uh, pollution, climate change, um, um, but also um, with regards uh, to security, with regards to <laughs> migration, with regards to um, interconnectivity, um, AI development uh, in, in, in technology, this is not something that countries alone or a club of countries can um, um, uh, solve on their own, they need this cooperation. And I think here we would uh, also have the possibility with this pragmatic name to indicate that there is a close uh, linkage to the existing EU institutions. So um, it uh, should uh, also be something that we can have um, the, the possibility to utilize here, for instance, the enhanced cooperation procedure that is already there in the Treaty of the European Union. Um, where we would have also the possibility to um, further uh, integrate this into the EU architecture. And the overall benefit would also be we have already existing instruments for funding um, that are managed uh, within the EU, but also within uh, partner countries, uh, EFTA and uh, the likes. So we believe the important advantage here is that uh, current non-EU member countries would have a seat at the table and a voice at the table. These uh, meetings would uh, take place either before or after meetings of the European Council, therefore also the closer linkage not only with the name, but uh, why not sit at the same table, like physically at the same table, not figuratively speaking, um, and then having also the possibility to have a smoother transition from maybe becoming a, a candidate country and then negotiating and then uh, finally becoming um, a full EU member. 
Um, it strengthens, strengthens the legitimacy of EU uh, programs and uh, uh, EU topics because if we uh, talk with countries that are uh, beyond EU membership, um, this, uh, of course, enhances uh, outreach. And uh, it could be even a testing ground um, because if cooperation happens in this looser GEC format, why should that not then be also enshrined into uh, the treaties um, of the European Union? So therefore, and I'm uh, slowly coming uh, to an end here, we have, uh, should um, not only um, uh, also further explore the idea of this greater European Council with regards to um, the conference on uh, the future of Europe, which I believe um, was uh, a good exercise, but very poorly executed and uh, then implemented. Um, I don't know if you, if you actually have heard about this. Uh, it was a year-long process um, where uh, EU member uh, citizens could uh, give ideas on how the future of the European Union should look like. And then the outcome, one of the outcomes was this European political community, but this has not been really discussed in the year uh, before. So we believe um, a, a proper outcome would be um, a further idea how to uh, move from here um, and also uh, bring back together this um, hand in hand of deepening and widening. So a treaty reform for uh, the implementation of a, a greater European Council is not necessary, but um, it might be also uh, paving the way to further uh, reform of the European institutional setup. And the EU president here, mandated by the European Council, could then uh, use the next EPC meeting, because if we then meet for the fourth time, um, as I said, this, this picture of, of being there as the only sole outcome um, is, 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 is getting old in itself, um, we might have a possibility to upgrade uh, this and therefore we advocate for um, an, an uh, introduction of this uh, format um, maybe at the next uh, summit. And therefore, and here now um, I truly conclude, the um, uh, situation at the moment in the neighborhood will remain very uh, challenging. We uh, see that the uh, Potential candidate countries, the candidate countries, but also the EU, must expect um, these uh, economic, financial, humanitarian, but also political crisis that was uh, triggered by the uh, Russian Federation will um, uh, be here to stay. Sanctions will help to alleviate uh, the situation to a certain extent, but only if they are uh, maximized with EU countries as well as the potential uh, candidate countries and solidarity support and joint action of the EU countries um, is essential for the implementation of a united Europe together with the potential candidate countries or even countries, uh, former uh, member countries and countries that do not become, uh, want to become a member. And if we need, want to overcome the hurdles of EU enlargement, um, we should look to different uh, possibilities that are not a replacement for enlargement because it cannot be um, you cannot demand reforms and you cannot demand painful uh, um, 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 uh, policy changes when there is at the end the uncertainty if that is actually also rewarding and um, therefore um, we believe that a different approach to um, enlargement here again would be necessary and of course also a different approach uh, to be built on the rubble of European uh, security orders. Uh, we will have to see that um, there is a, a multi-layered um, structure with a strategic interplay between NATO, EU and even a upgraded European political community which to our understanding would be the best solution with the Greater European Council and then um, the emerging security order needs to end also this limbo situations for countries that are between NATO, uh, EU and Russia and um, here of course especially uh, countries uh, like uh, Ukraine, like um, Moldova. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'm uh, very happy to answer any questions that uh, might have arisen from my uh, presentation and of course also feel free to keep in touch 
uh, with us through our social media uh, channels and, and the website, or feel free to write me uh, directly if you have any questions or if we can do something for you. Thank you very much. So, dear Sebastian, thank you so much for your, this presentation and giving us uh, an overview about the uh, European Union uh, developments and of some ideas about the future developments. Everything, of course, is connected to the reality. And if the effort from the inside of the country and uh, if the effort of the whole countries from the European Union and from the candidates uh, will be orientated to the right way, probably we will succeed. So before I will give the floor to the, the um, people from the, the auditorium, I would like to ask your opinion about Euroscepticism, because we have to uh, agree that between us or among of us, we have a huge uh, uh, part of communities in different countries, um, supported by local politicians or supported by, uh, from abroad. Some of them are influenced by the Russian propaganda or by the Brexit mm -hmm. as a result of breaking the European Union. What do you think about this phenomenon? And of course, how we have to deal with it? Yeah. Thank you. Well, this, I, I think this is, uh, this is the, the million dollar uh, question, uh, especially for next year with regards to the elections of the European yeah. Parliament. But uh, we also need to become much more resilient um, towards these uh, propaganda uh, efforts. Eh? There's a lot of, of disinformation, there's a lot of misinformation, a lot of fake news regarding um, what uh, the European Union is, could do or should do. And um, I think uh, we, we need to be much more vocal um, and, and also show the benefits that we have of, of uh, European integration. Uh, we, we far too often take all of these things for granted. And here especially the ones who already have that. Because, I mean, uh, when we experienced, for instance, during the pandemic, how uh, borders were closed, or if you um, now... Uh, still see the situation how uh, Romania and Bulgaria are not in, in Schengen. Um, and, 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 and all these, these possibilities that are rising here are taken for granted and you only realize it if you, if you don't have it, yeah? if you suddenly have to queue again at the border. Or if you realize, hmm, I also have to queue at the border if I actually go from a EU member country to Romania or outside of the EU. Um, we are, we are talking to, to far too less about uh, these situations and I have sometimes the feeling that there are um, much more Eurosceptics within the EU than outside uh, on, in the vicinity of, of the European Union. Yeah? Um, and and uh, I mean, ultimately when we break it down, what is happening in Ukraine is that there are Ukrainians and also uh, people in the country dying because they want these closer uh, integration to the European Union. And then there's other countries, EU member countries, that are trying to dismantle it from within. Now, um, uh, one, one approach, again, is I think we need, to, we need to stress much more the benefits and talk about the benefits. Because the headlines is always what Brussels is not doing or what Brussels is imposing. But it's not what Brussels is helping us to achieve. I think this is, this is a dire, dire need um, to, to uh, communicate this better. And the second thing that I believe also with regards to uh, helping understand European politics and Euro how European institutions work is that we need uh, a better coordination among the parties in the uh, European Union. Because what we are having now is not one European parliamentary election, we have 27. European parliamentary elections in each and every country. And each country has its own yeah. quota. Yeah. So uh, there, there are some attempts from some parties to Europeanize, but uh, there is a, there's a, a not, not much of a cross-border uh, uh, discussion. So I believe here again, also what we should do is strengthen the regions. Uh, they, of course, the, the, the Eurosceptics don't want to give away uh, sovereignty and power. This is one of the core arguments that they are having. Um, but I believe that we need to not only look to the supranational level and give competences to the uh, Commission, but also give more competences to regions. And in the interplay of that multi-level governance, this can prevent single uh, populists of single countries uh, hijacking 
EU policies. Because you disperse the decision making, you have more qualified majority decision making um, and take away the veto power of single populist um, uh, governments within the European Union. Yeah. Thank you so much for your um, very well pointed um, uh, answer of this from these two, two perspectives. Uh, anyway, it remains a very difficult phenomenon and uh, of, of course we have to disseminate more information about the benefits, about usefulness and of course about the attractiveness. Yeah. So we have to become more attractive. Um, as being part of European Union, but also this attractiveness will solve some many other local problems. In our case, the problem in relation with the Transnistria or the, this separatist region and separatist regime, uh, which has to understand that just being together, just reunited society, would, could, uh, we could reach the goal and to become this uh, part of this uh, um, European Union uh, community, mm -hmm. which is very important from many points of view, but especially economical, and not just from the uh, economic point of view, but also from different other social culture and so on and so on. Uh, mobility and because everything is uh, connected to the education mm -hmm. uh, in front of us we have the future teachers yeah. uh, and they have to be a really um, uh, good uh, presenters and disseminating people uh, of the European U Union values uh, about Euro European Union better understanding through uh, students in school uh, through young generation because the future it's in their hands yeah. and what we are talking today it's about them it's about the future, it's about the uh, perspective to, to build or to do a contribution to the peaceful society, because nowadays European Union means not just economic, but also the peaceful and sustainable peace development mm -hmm. in the region, especially of this situation in Ukraine and recently in Israel, or uh, in uh, this Israel-Palestinian uh, uh, conflict, which is uh, strange, but it's, it's happening really uh, <clears throat> right now. So it's not so uh, close to Moldova, but anyway, it's, it's a, a case of uh, demonstrating that we didn't uh, so much to solve the conflicts. Mm -hmm. And the frozen conflicts all, always could be um, reactivated. Yeah. So Transnistria or other cases, and recently we have seen what's happening in Nagorno-Karabakh in this uh, conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and which is still a very complicated mm -hmm. uh, situation in the region. So the floor is yours. The questions from the auditorium. You could ask everything to Sebastian, <laughs> what are you thinking about us as Moldovans and also uh, about the Moldovan perspective um, or how it is the perception of Moldova in Vienna and uh, institutions around Austria and around the European Union. Întrebări, puteți să puneți în română și le traducem. Haideți, mai activ. I know it's always the, the challenge who, who is the first one to ask a question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Don't worry, it's the, there are no stupid questions. I only give maybe a stupid answer. Hadith. Cum vedeți voi situația de la noi și intențiile noastre de a adera la Uniunea Europeană? Foarte foarte bună și interesantă perspectivă. Mai ales în situația Republicii Moldova, care are mai multe controverse. I said that especially in our situation, yeah. we have a lot of controversies. Yeah. So. <laughs> noi avem speranța în voi, în generația tânără. Pasivitate. Mai mult curaj. Eu înțeleg. Da. So, Mr. Da, trebuie să vorbiți la microfon ca să se audă și... Yeah. Da. Cei, cei de la online, nu, nu, că filmare. Deci dacă vreți să vă ridicați, să vorbiți la microfon ca cei de la online să audă. So, Mr. Sebastian Schaeffer, thank you for great insights into European perspectives for our country. Uh, for sure, we, um, all our nation, yeah, um, uh, is very positive and optimistic regarding or related to the process of EU or European integration. Uh, what should do? our country, uh, always we hope that we'll get uh, enough and good quality supervising from European uh, and we'll succeed. Mm -hmm. What should we do, still we do, yeah, yeah to uh, achieve or maybe to do this road successfully? Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much. Thank so you. please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. And here I would say 
there are um, two important aspects to it. The first aspect is, of course, there is a lot of things to be done uh, with regards to fulfilling the Copenhagen criteria. Uh, and here, <coughs> especially the most demanding chapters, um, rule of law, um, independence of the judiciary, um, the challenges with regards to uh, combating corruption, the challenges with uh, regards to um, 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 transforming uh, according to all the directives and regulations and all the challenges that are rising from the single market of uh, the European Union. But at the same time, I believe here uh, there is uh, the possibility to work uh, closely together with um, the, the neighboring country, Romania, and the experiences that they have had of their uh, EU integration uh, process. So this is one thing, being aware that it's not going to be a short uh, and easy um, road just because the overall geopolitical situation uh, changed. Um, on the other hand, uh, the, the, the second aspect here is um, stay vigilant and try to um, also always um, remind the, not necessarily so much the European Commission, but rather the EU member countries, that this process is a two-way street. You do the reforms, but there must also be the willingness to work together with uh, Moldova and to provide a realistic midterm perspective uh, for um, becoming an EU member. And we should not leave it in this limbo. Okay, so what was happening with the Western Balkan countries, the, the uh, six remaining countries that are not a member yet? Um, I, in, in my observation, it was they pretend that they want to become an EU member, and the EU member countries pretend that they want them to uh, be inside the European Union. And in order to avoid this trap, demand that if you do reforms and if there are steps, that there are real benefits and real tangible results. There is uh, um, an, an approach that was proposed uh, by uh, colleagues from a think tank uh, from uh, Serbia and also from Brussels process which would mean that on the way there will be uh, possibilities, for instance, to receive um, a certain proportion of the EU budget when you have fulfilled um, uh, the uh, criteria uh, of uh, accession um, to a, a certain satisfactory uh, level. This is one possibility. There are other possibilities to it, but the current process is not, is not working. So demand that when you do this, that um, there will be tangible results coming from the European Union and uh, its member countries and that they are not uh, blocking uh, progress because this, of course, plays into the hands of uh, the populists, but also, of course, of Eurosceptics in, in your own country. Because there is a le regular election cycle and uh, if there is no... Uh, you cannot bet on it that, okay, within four years you will have significant uh, reforms and steps uh, so that you are able to present a result. Um, so demand that there is a possibility and remind um, about the fragility of the situation in the neighborhood Sergio has mentioned. There is a lot of, of frozen or, or not so frozen conflicts uh, already here, but also everywhere else. And I think the best policy, and as you said, the most successful peace policy um, over the past maybe even in the, in the history of this continent has been European integration because we have not seen um, so long uh, um, decades of peace uh, between the countries that are EU member countries. And we see that this unpeace um, or even the war um, is escalating in those countries who are not an EU uh, member. So it's, 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 it's not an easy answer, not an not a easy blueprint, um, but this, this would be the two things that I would say um, utilize uh, experiences um, and, and also demand um, um, and progress uh, on the other side. Yeah, thank you. Quite <clears throat> well answered and very uh, well explained. Of course, it's a long and very difficult process. It, it's not an easy way, mm -hmm. not just to become, but to be a real member, uh, equal member between other countries which already reach a lot of standards and we have to follow them. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, most of the uh, inhabitants of the citizens of Moldova or Ukraine or other countries, they are looking for short and very fast process. 
and always they're saying, if you not reach the goal, we are disappointed and let's vote other parties which are not so well supporting the European Union uh, or integration process. So in Moldova it's the same, uh, so the huge part of society, uh, it's, it's maintaining the same position. Uh, we have different situations, in some cases we are really ex uh, exceptions. For example, Gagauzian community, mm. they are looking for EU funds, mm. but still looking what saying in Russia and supporting Russia. So uh, this is a difficult situation. Uh, how to transform? Probably, as we already mentioned, to try to inform them, to demonstrate that, as you mentioned right now, that European Union means peaceful atmosphere and also open market, open and mobility uh, between the countries, inside of the countries and so on. Up access to the market, uh, access to the better paid jobs, access to the education. So many uh, Moldovan uh, kids are going to study in the European Union uh, using this opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this situation, probably we have to improve our information process and dissemination through the uh, citizens. But my question is from pragmatic point of view. It is realistically that Moldova will become a full member during the next 10 years? Yes, yes, absolutely, um, because I believe there is no other possibility for cooperation on the European continent. We, if, if, if a country wants to become an EU member, we should do everything to support this country to fulfill this goal. Because, uh, again, no, uh, no enlargement has uh, brought uh, any significant disadvantages to all other countries. Uh, there is no enlargement round where you would say, oh, if this would not have happened, we would be so much better off. Absolutely not, not, in, not even in economic terms, because there is, a, there is a miscalculation what is done. We always talk about net payers and net recipients, but this net is counted on how much do I pay into the uh, budget and how much do I get out of it. Yeah, if you look at one cake, of course, not everyone can get the same portion of the cake that they put ingredients into this cake. But there is not one cake. Because how is the EU budget functioning? The EU does not have, with very minor exceptions, direct taxes that are transferred to the budget. The budget of the European Union exists through transfers according to GDP. So the more successful you are, the more economically successful you are, the more you pay into that which is, I think, quite a fair um, uh, distribution. Because why is Germany paying so much into this? Because Germany is tremendously benefiting from being part of the single market, being able to trade without barriers, with uh, roughly most of the, uh, the member countries now, the same currency. Even. Yeah? So there's, a, there, there's always been, uh, even in economic terms, it's much better than it was before. But the, the, the most important thing here is that, this, uh, the, that um, the, the uh, 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 integration um, of uh, societies provides opportunities um, and this is the best preventive mechanism um, to, to, towards populists and towards, um, towards uh, 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 war, actually. Um, and here I, I believe we should really focus. You should criticize the European Union. There's a lot of things that, that can be improved. But the alternative to it yeah, is not to completely destroy it and build a whatever is right now called this Europe of Nations or whatsoever, because this has historically been the challenge for the continent. That was when the resurgence of, of uh, nationalism came and we can certain, certainly uh, observe uh, a movement in this direction and we must stop that at all costs. And uh, coming back to the, to the initial question, yes, I believe that uh, there is a possibility because um, there, there have been other um, uh, challenging integrations into the EU that have happened. Of course, the, the overall situation was different. Uh, um, one example that I would say is, for instance, the integration of the uh, former GDR. There was no European Union, there was no single market, there was no common currency, etc. So it, it was a very easy and quick path, but it was not without challenges. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Germany is still working out some of these challenges uh, up until today. But uh, overall, again, 
a success because how the situation was 30 years ago, um, even if there are some nostalgia and some, I would say, even demented nostalgia how the situation was 30 years ago, um, it's so much better. Everything is so much better. And uh, um, if, if we work together, uh, I, I absolutely believe that we can easily overcome uh, these kind of challenges, although it's going to be a long road. But I, I want uh, within the next decade um, to, to come uh, back to Chisinau, which is then a EU member country capital. Thank you so much for your very optimistic perspective. So, another question from Publicum. Cine vrea să mai întrebe? Vă rog. Nu toți o dat pe rând. I know it can be overwhelming uh, and I, I talk yeah. a lot and I talk uh, about many different uh, things. So I, I and, they, and they had a lot of classes since yeah. 8 o'clock yeah. in the morning, so <laughs> that's, uh, they already are tired. Yeah. Uh, probably one last question from yeah. my side and then, then we could close the meeting. Yeah. Um, I would like, because you are very close to the academia and the university uh, environment, so uh, how you could see that the future improvement, involvement of the Moldovan academic and university environment, which of course it's part of the process. Mm -hmm. it's, it should be part of reforming and uh, trying to, to assume these European Union standards in education and also reaching the goal of the quality of education, but also looking for the long-term perspectives. Mm -hmm. So how or what exactly should we do to reach the goals or to reach the European Union standards mm -hmm. or standards from the Western European universities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, I, I think if I look around here, uh, you're you are on a good way. Yeah? You're utili utilizing possibilities. I remember when I first arrived here in, uh, it was May 2014. Yes. Um, and if I look especially over the edge and down that corridor, uh, this is this is quite an improvement, um, and uh, um, my <laughs> yeah, I I, I believe I believe yeah I believe uh, this is this is this is absolutely an improvement yeah and uh, actually you know my my uh, my wife she uh, used to work here at the university um, at the DAD um, um, uh, chair, and uh, I, I took a picture earlier when I arrived and sent her the picture and uh, asked her, like, hey, uh, do you really? and she's like, where are you? <laughs> and uh, she couldn't believe that I'm here. So um, this, is, this is already a, a step in the right direction. But uh, in a, in a more, on a more serious note, what, what, is, uh, what is necessary? I think one of the major challenges um, that, that you're seeing, and this is one of the, the things that will happen in, in this paradoxic, things that European integration brings with itself. Because the closer you are coming to um, a European uh, Union membership and the more exchange happens, and especially here, I mean, in the case of Moldova, we can see it uh, with the um, possibility to also have Romanian citizenship, you easily can access um, the um, uh, labor market, but also uh, the higher education um, uh, uh, area in, within the European Union. Yeah? So the benefit that is there, where we, where we definitely see we want this type of exchange, we want this type of mobility and movement, at the same time, of course, poses the challenge that you are losing um, people in your country yes. that are moving away. And so with being more successful in European integration, you at the same time uh, have the challenge that you are undermining the future capabilities uh, of your own country. Um, same as with, you know, when you, when you are uh, moving uh, closer towards uh, uh, the, the, the Schengen integration, um, it, it just shifts the borders. Eh? And so um, for other countries that remain outside of this club, um, it, it creates higher uh, borders and higher challenges, uh, although European integration is, is all about dismantling borders and dismantling uh, these challenges. So sometimes European integration can be very paradoxically and uh, we, we would have to find a possibility to um, make it uh, attractive enough 
that we have not only this, this brain drain, but uh, turn it into this brain circulation. I'm, I'm using phrases that are out there for, for decades, and I know that, because I don't have a better solution um, and, and, and better possibilities here, but I think what needs to be done is to provide also an attractive environment at home and the benefits of, of coming back. And with this, with, with this type of transformation and with this type of better possibilities, I think this is, this is the way that connecting, having, having programs uh, within the EU, having exchange within the EU is a great thing. You learn, but then what you have learned, you bring back uh, to your country and it should be attractive enough in your own country um, that, that you do this. So uh, providing opportunities um, for people uh, having it attractive enough um, would be would be uh, uh, one thing that that I believe, and uh, it's it's not of course the most challenging thing here is not fancy equipment. The most challenging thing is proper pay, and in general we need to understand. Yeah, I mean I know how how the situation is in Moldova and it's dire, but in general, overall, the the appreciation of a certain type of work, like teachers like university um, uh, staff, uh, like, uh, but also uh, when it comes to, to other challenging um, um, uh, areas, all this care work, yeah? taking care of small children, taking care of the elderly, is something that is not paid enough, and we should pay much more attention to this, and the, and the, and the shiny equipment is not going to be the, the attractiveness uh, to stay here. But then uh, we have other uh, 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 shining examples like you. You are here. You are a, a um, not only a brilliant uh, professor, but you are very active in, in, in various fields. And you are still here. And, and yeah. this, is a, this is a shining example um, that, that others uh, should, should follow. And I believe this would be uh, this would be uh, the key for the future of, of not only Moldova, but um, countries facing similar uh, challenges here. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Sebastian, for appreciation, of course, and also for, for um, um, some points which are related to the salaries, but uh, not just the salaries and the, the conditions which we are, have to... Uh, well, we are improving, and we have to, to continue in this way. Of course, we have to, to pay more attention to responsibilities uh, which we have to assume in this process and, of course, to change the mentality, which are still, in some cases, remain, as you mentioned, already nostalgic for the some uh, period of time, which is very strange, young generation looking to the nostalgia of the old people, because yeah. they do not know exactly how it was, but yeah. because the grandparents or the parents mentioned it was better. Yeah. It depends what they mean better. Mm. Better because, more or less, more stability but in other circumstances, not so much opportunity to travel. The sal salaries were also very low. Ask your grandparents, and they will say, if they receive 90 rubles, how they could manage the, uh, the, the, the budget, the family budget uh, of this small amount uh, of monthly uh, salary. Um, so this is, uh, should be comparable and, of course, should be de debated to understand that the uh, nowadays society uh, offers to the public more opportunities and we have to become more competitive because in 21st century we have to maintain the uh, written to be uh, on step of these uh, challenges, on these provocations, on these opportunities and then probably we will reach. Uh, always we are trying to say look to the Baltic countries and how they succeed and why Moldova is not following the same way or rules. It's easy to say. They established they want to become EU member or NATO member, and they did. And not oscillating from left to the right or from the east to the west. So the same issue it should be for Moldova. If we agree and accept that we, the main goal of Moldovan society is to become a full member, doesn't matter which party will rule the country, but the whole political class will do effort to reach the goal. Otherwise, of course, we will stay on the same place.
So thank you so much, and thank you, of course, for supporting Moldova and for supporting young generations, or your programs, your activities, um, your um, trainings, uh, workshops, and uh, summer schools. I think it's a real contribution to help young generations, to encourage them, because sometimes we have to pay attention to this one, to encourage people that we are following the right way and we are doing uh, exactly what we have to do, but probably we have to unite the efforts and to become more stronger and more powerful from various ways. So this is, I think, um, a real example, a good example, just being together, supporting each other, we could build a real united Europe. Mm -hmm. So best wishes and of course congratulations on this anniversary of 70 years. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you also for, for being here and uh, letting me uh, talk to you. Uh, feel free to please reach out um, and if, if you have uh, questions that uh, might arise later, we are here and if there is something that you disagree with but didn't want to say uh, publicly here, please do so. Write me. I, I want to hear this. I want to hear what is uh, going on. And uh, I will only keep you one and a half minutes longer because I want to say thank you very much to Sergio um, for hosting us here and giving the opportunity uh, for our right. 70th anniversary. We have already merchandise yeah. uh, and you are one of the few people who already gets this because this is for our big 5th December uh, anniversary celebration and uh, this uh, includes also our wonderful uh, IDM 70 years notebook and the 70 years um, pen but I have one more special thing that is not going to be uh, distributed to our attendees of that conference because I wrote a book. Yeah. I wrote a book about uh, stories about uh, Ukraine and Moldova and um, it's in German and I know that you read German and uh, therefore I think uh, this is a possibility to keep up uh, with your German and uh, I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> to travel in Kitchener and keep pass in Alice as a market in the end of this incident. Noi ne mulțumim foarte mult că ați găsit timp. Sper că nu îl considerați ca timp pierdut, ci din contra ați mai văzut altă lume, ați mai văzut alte discursuri și în felul acesta ne-am cunoscut mai bine. Așa că succes în tot ce faceți și știți că viitorul e mâinile voastre. Astăzi cumva parcă voi depindeți de noi, dar mâine, poi mâine, noi vom depinde de voi. Și eu aș vrea să am bătrâneți liniștiți. I said that in, uh, nowadays, more or less, they're depending on what, uh, on our decision, what yeah. we're doing. But in a few days, yeah. we will depend on them. Yes. And I would like to have my, when I retire, yeah. to have a peaceful and yeah. uh, really calm atmosphere. Yes, yes. please. Yeah. yeah. So. Thank you very much. Good to meet all of you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for the gift. Thank you. Yeah. I hope. Thank you. That was great. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Thank you.